and welcome to Spotlights. This is the podcast for the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology, and I'm your host, Sam Mickey. And this week on the show, I'm really happy to welcome Jason Brown. Jason. Hey, Sam. It's really awesome to be here. Thank yeah, you so thanks for me. thanks for making time for us. Yes. So, um, what you're teaching in uh, the humanities department over at Simon Fraser University, uh, but I know you do a lot of teaching. Kind of, maybe if you could introduce yourself a little bit, say uh, where you're teaching, what kind of stuff you're teaching, and uh, where you're at in the field of religion and ecology. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, um, the backstory of of, or do you want just the teaching, or do you want the backstory too? Uh, well, you know what? Let's start with the backstory. Yeah. Okay. How I got to the field, sort of a thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, I did university at uh, the Mormon own school, the uh, LDS school in Utah, Brigham Young University. I was raised in the Mormon tradition. Uh, I've since left the Mormon tradition, but I went to that university and I was doing anthropology there. And I knew I wanted to do something uh, related to ecology. So I ended up doing a field study uh, in Guatemala, where I was uh, doing ethnographic research around um, trees, forests, and the forest commons, like the, you know, the sort of common spaces in in Guatemala. But I would often like sort of pace the library uh, on Friday nights, because that's what I did. And uh, <laughs> I came across Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm's series, Religions of the World and Ecology. And that sort of turned on a light for me. And so when I went to Yale for forestry school, which I, I didn't even know they were there at the mm -hmm. time, but I went to Yale for forestry school and then connected the fact that they were doing the joint degree in religion and ecology. And I was just like, well, I, I guess I'm supposed to be here. So I did the <laughs> joint degree. I did the joint degree in forestry and theology at Yale and got to work with Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm. I was their TA in a couple of classes and took their the, what, whatever they offered. And then um, in my PhD, I ended up um, kind of combining those by studying Catholic monks and their sense of place and their concepts of the environment. So I did kind of walking interviews with um, monks at four different monasteries. But uh, for the PhD, I ended up at the University of British Columbia. And so after I graduated in 2017, I stuck around and, and, and was teaching for actually the resources and environment um, faculty at Simon Fraser. So I was teaching an environmental ethics class, but then I reached out to humanities. And so now I'm kind of jointly appointed between as a lecturer between humanities on the one hand and resource and environmental management on the other. So I teach like intro to religious studies uh, sections. I teach uh, an environmental ethics section for the resource uh, folks. That's kind of like a writing intensive. And it's not like um, it's not in the philosophy department. So it's not like, you know, super um, rigorous in terms of philosophical methods and, and uh, kind of lineage. So we can be a little more creative and sort of uh, general in our approach. Mm -hmm. Um, but then humanities has all of these, you know, repeating sections, uh, you know, explorations in the humanities kinds of sections, uh, upper division, and they've let me kind of co craft these courses out of those. And so I did a, a, a religion and ecology course that I teach. I've taught about four times now. And then this term I'm teaching a class on that's called uh, trees, forests and the human imagination. So I've been I've really been lucky uh, to be able to teach um, not just sort of uh, entry level and, you know, department staples, but like um, creative classes and have a lot of fun with them. And uh, and I actually teach uh, in Washington as well. I teach at Western Washington University, which is just across the border. So I'm an international <laughs> teacher <laughs> teaching in Canada and, and Washington. And before the pandemic, I was commuting across the border, but now everything's on Zoom. So I just have to roll out of bed and here I am. <laughs> yeah, not not as complicated. Yeah, I like the all the border crossings. So you're also you know, teaching across countries. 
but then you're also teaching across, you know, humanities and then kind of resource management. And uh, yeah, I appreciate that. That's one of the things that's really unique, I guess, about our field is if you're studying religion and ecology, uh, you're often thinking about international issues, but we're also having to deal with the fact that we're not exactly sciences. We're not exactly humanities. Yeah. You could lump us into philosophy, but it's not just philosophy. It's, you know, trying to find a home. So I appreciate you pioneering some of these kinds of connections. I think some schools are still afraid of uh, joint positions. They don't know how to do it. They're like, pick a department. You can't be in two departments at the same time. We don't know how to do that yet. <laughs> so I'm glad that you're uh, making a headway uh, well, in that regard. I've been lucky because I started out as like as a sessional, which is the, the equivalent of an adjunct. And you can do, you know, uh, you can, if you have the, the training, you can teach for any department you want, you know, so I was a defaultly jointly appointed, right? But mm -hmm. now the two, I've gotten the two departments talking and they're sort of like, okay, well, we'll share the, the, the lecturer contract that's, that's a year long. So it's not like I have any kind of officially, you know, tenured, like, you know, the, the fancy sounding name joint chair of like right. religion and ecology. <laughs> But like uh, that we're doing this kind of piecemeal um, interdisciplinary, you know, um, still kind of contingent uh, stuff, right? That our field is kind of, um, we've had to sort of, uh, we love, we, we're passionate about it, but we end up having to, to cobble together positions out of departments. And, you know, um, that's just sort of the reality of our working conditions, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, as uh, as the world's changing, these disciplines are changing, and schools are, are trying to keep up, but yeah, we kind of have to keep pushing them. Um, and Simon Fraser was like a very experimental and sort of um, progressive university with, you know, in the throughout the 60s and 70s, a lot of American uh, dodge, uh, draft dodgers during the Vietnam War came up to uh, Simon Fraser. So it has this kind of lineage of um of experimentation and 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 progressive thought but it's you know it's kind of bursting at the seams with a very big sort of um first and second generation immigrant uh population who are going to university you know uh and so they're having to really kind of um uh level out a bit you know they have to you know bring a more conventional model uh, but all of those seeds are still there for sure. Hmm. Interesting. So, yeah, I didn't know that. Draft, draft dodgers plant, planting some good seeds. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the story of, of Simon Fraser. You nice. Know. Well, geez, speaking of seeds, I know uh, one of the things that you do a lot of work with is plants, trees. And um, I think that's still something that is slowly coming into people's awareness. I think there was a lot of focus on animals when people think of you know what do you think about the environment or like well what about animals should we eat them should we not eat them and you focus a lot on animals or it gets really big and then people just start talking about things like climate change or mass extinction yeah. and i think plants are still getting short shrift i think it's doing better lately um but so i appreciate that you're kind of in that area so i'm wondering if you could tell us a little about uh your work with trees in general sure sure yeah, and um, obviously, I think you'll have Laura on the show. But Laura Pustarfi is a is a kind of a towering figure in this conversation as well. So, f um, future episodes um, to to kind of connect with her. But my connection goes all the way back to the to my undergrad field work. Right, I was like, well, I, at first I kind of was more of an artist. I wanted to do photography, but then. Um, during my um, LDS missionary experience, so all, a lot of LDS folks go on two-year missions. Um, I loved photography, but I really connected with this more kind of um, scholarly pursuit of, of, um, of language, culture, and the environment. Like those things just sort of solidified for me during that, that experience. So when I, when I started university, I, you know, changed my major to anthropology. And in that field study, I was studying the kind of, I was learning how to be literate in the cultural landscape, right? That's the sort of anthropological method. Talk to people and learn how they, you know, the meaning and, and symbols and categories. 
they use to understand the world. So there's no word for nature, like, oh, interesting, it's just the world. But then, you know, uh, in asking them to talk about trees and forests, I wanted to, you know, be, be more literate in the ecological landscape. What kind of history of occupation, degradation, you know, what, what kinds of other measurements could we look at? And so that really kind of sparked my interest in trees and forests. And it was, there was kind of a vocational moment where I was like, I'm not, you know, I was like, it was, uh, you know, I was on this mountaintop, this misty mountaintop with my host family. They were like gathering herbs for the, for the meal that night. And I felt like this sort of like click again of, that it was like, rather than continuing in the discipline of anthropology, that uh, forestry and forest management was maybe a good direction for me. And that's how I found the Yale School of Forestry uh, because I was searching like, you know, culture and, and like society right. and because I, you know, still fancied myself an anthropologist of trees and forests. Right. And they have a strong kind of social ecology focus at the Yale School of Forestry. Hmm. And so I applied one year and got rejected. And then uh, in, the, in the second year of applications, because I didn't end up going anywhere the first year, I got in and decided to take on some debt and go to Yale. And so I still kind of wonder about that decision. Um, but I, I ended up at the forestry school. And, and really kind of designed that joint degree program around this idea that I was like a social scientist of forests, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm not a very good forester and I'm not a good, very good anthropologist <laughs> as a result, you know? Right. So, but um, I did the, I did the um, uh, Yale Forest uh, summer work, right? I worked at the Yale Forest for a summer where you go from, you know, like identifying stands to marking trees, mm. uh, you know, that whole experience. And then when I graduated from Yale, I went back to Salt Lake City. And in the winter, fall, winter, I was teaching at, a, at the Salt Lake Community College and Utah Valley University. And in the summertime, I worked for the U.S. Forest Service as a forester. So, I mean, that was a dream job, like, you know, teaching in the fall, winter and then uh, forestry in the summer. That's cool. But the working conditions in both settings were not very secure. Mm -hmm. There was no benefits or, you know, there's nothing that could really make me feel like I could do that forever sort of a thing. And I, and I also, I felt like I was, I wanted to read, write and think about forests more than I wanted to spend 40 hours a week, uh, marking them to be cut down sort of a thing. Right. Although, you know, we were doing good work. We were, we were um, managing a spruce beetle outbreak, hmm. but the, the, the trees that were being attacked were these beautiful old growth spruce up in the, you know, at 10,000 feet in the Uinta Mountains. So it was, it was good, but also a little heartbreaking, yeah. you know. And so, and so the forest kind of theme continued through there. And then in my PhD, I didn't do my PhD at the forestry school. I did it at an interdisciplinary institute called the Institute for Resources, Environment and Sustainability at UBC. And um, my advice, supervisor encouraged me to, to pursue the monastic project, you know, so it was more of a phenomenology of place, you know, monastic phenomenology of place. But the the Abbey of Our Guadalupe in Oregon, which was one of the core monasteries in my study, has a sustainable forestry project. They they um, purchased the property in 1950 in the early 1950s, and the the previous owner um, clear cut it before they right after they bought it. So they they bought it and it was beautiful and forested, and he cut and run basically. Wow. So the monks spent the next 30 years planting by hand, you know, uh, nearly 800 acres of, of forest. Wow. And, and they, they, because they're Trappists, they have this sort of agrarian mentality. And it was very, it was a tree farm, you know. But then in the 1980s, the monks really started to talk about a more sustainable approach. So they hired a consultant 
and now they have an ecosystem-based management project uh, forestry um, program and they've even restored some of the Oregon white oak savanna which is a endangered ecosystem in uh, in the foothills of the of the Cascades so forestry kind of runs throughout that and um, you know ever since ever since Yale when we would go out on field trips and, and they'd be like this is this kind of tree and this is this kind of tree and I, and I would always want to ask about beauty right I was those conversations always for me gravitated towards the the humanities and so I always wanted to teach a class on on trees and forests in the humanities and I've been so you know blessed by SFU they basically said here's a section what would you like to teach and I said how about a class on trees and forests in the humanities and they said okay not bad <laughs> so I feel very lucky and I put together a, 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 a syllabus and I feel like there's just a wealth of material that's coming out of this um out of this class so yeah and are you teaching uh people who are majoring in something that would be relevant to that like environmental studies majors or are these mostly people for whom you're introducing this topic this kind of weird intersection of trees and humanities it's basically for um, I'm, you know, it's basically for the general student body who need a upper division humanities course uh, to graduate. <laughs> nice. And they end up so getting I've an got, environmental humanities. I've got people in there who are in business, engineering, you know, life sciences, uh, a couple of um, resource management folks who've taken my environmental ethics class, a couple of students who've taken my intro to religious studies class. You know, it's um, so it's a totally mixed bag and we're all kind of learning together, you know, like, nice. you know, like I don't have I don't have classical training in, you know, let's say mythology, for example. Right. So I'm in a lot of ways I'm coming to some of this material for the first or second time. Uh, and so it's really been a great exploration for me as a scholar to round out my understanding of the humanities. Um, but some of these folks haven't even thought about the trees in their backyard, you know. Right. So, so one of the assignments is a is a arboreality journal. So they have to do a reading response, but they also have to sort of engage uh, this journal theme, which one of them is to sort of okay, what what are the five closest trees to the place that you sleep, hmm. you know, and 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 students, some of them are like, oh, I don't think there's any trees near me. <laughs> they realize you know that how how proximate trees are yep. or that you know the woody perennials are are in our coffee are you know providing right. our food they're in our houses you know so that's been a big wake-up call for that's a lot a, that's great yeah. i'm gonna have to steal that assignment that's a good oh, one yeah, i'll send you the syllabus but the the journal theme i find a really good pedagogical tool i use it in my religion and ecology class and so it carried over into this. So it's like, yes, you need to respond to the main themes of the reading, but here's this thing that will take that reading outside, you know, yeah. and you have to sort of go out and sit for 30 minutes without your phone, or you have <laughs> to go on a small pilgrimage, or you have to write a ecological rule of life, or you have to climb a tree, you know, like uh, nice. these themes that you have to do uh, that sort of take the readings outside. That's great. And the, it seems doable in the context of the pandemic as well, because like a lot of the kind of nature immersion, outdoor education stuff we would do, it would normally be groups getting together. Yeah. It sounds like in this case, they can kind of go on their own time in their own yard. Yeah. And uh, so you can still socially distance and, and learn about trees. Yeah, it works. It works in both settings really well. Um, so I think that this summer, they're going to have the resource folks are going to have me teach the forest ecosystem management course ah. and it'll be all online. So they're going to have the exact same sort of thing. It'll be more like, you know, um, go out on your own and then report back to your small group and then report nice. back to the, to the class sort of a thing. Nice. I like that a lot. Yeah. It's yeah. such a challenge teaching, uh, anything environmental through, through zoom. I've heard students, you're talking about what it's like doing dissections. You know, they're like, basically, they just videotape the dissection in the lab. Then they make us watch the video as if we're doing it. And then we are supposed to write a lab report. And it's all this very kind of disconnected, discombobulated thing. 
Um, so I'm wondering if you have any other uh, tips or tricks or strategies for folks who are um, trying to teach humanities or environmental work or both uh, online right now. Well, I use a standing desk right now. I'm sitting, oh. but I find that teaching standing up is really it really helps with the energy of the oh. class. You know, I, I teach standing up. Um, I limit any any online any synchronous portion to to two hours max. Uh, in my intro to religious studies course, I recorded the lectures, uh, so they watch those asynchronously, and I converted all of the lectures into mp3s so that huh? so that students can then I, I encourage them actually i say okay if you've had enough screen time take this outside listen to the mp3 outside go on a walk um, i've also included a lot more mp3s and youtube videos in my mm -hmm. curriculum mm -hmm. instead of long articles because there's enough screen time as it is so yeah, yeah. really giving students an, an option to to engage the material outside somehow but then, as you know, as I said, um, I assign uh, journals that actually require them to go outside right. and they have to reflect, write about it. So it has kind of the dual uh, purpose of engaging the material in a different way, getting them outside, um, but also kind of secretly and subtly and maybe not so subtly um, encouraging them to do self-reflective work so that the class becomes an opportunity for transformational learning rather than just, you know, concept and, and lineage memorization, which a lot of classes or in a lot of scholars kind of default to, cause it's like, I'm a knowledge keeper. And so you need to know the lineage of this, of this, um, of this discipline and you need to know the major pa papers and the controversies, you know, and, and yeah, they're, yeah. and we're knowledge keepers and we feel like we need to, you know, uh, dispense that. But I find that especially in undergraduate education, you know, it's not till it's not till graduate school that you really need to become familiar with the canon or the yeah, or yeah. the like, you know, the, and so so to me, it's like, well, let's just engage with the themes in ways that go beyond the boring essays. Let's engage with YouTube videos. Let's engage with MP3s uh, and, and reflective writing. And obviously I sneak in lots of uh, meaty meaty essays right they have to respond to those but i i entice them with these other uh, multi mixed media kinds of approaches and then and then when we get to class uh i make it a point to really check in with each student like mm -hmm. really sort of you know like how are you kind of face to face sort of thing mm -hmm. and you know you don't have time to do that with 50 students uh you know directly but but I find ways to really make sure they know that they're that I know they're there, you know, that I know that they can be um, that it's not just a name on a screen, right. you know, and in 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 person classes, I do that by memorizing everyone's names, you know, mm -hmm. and making making kind of a, a pedagogical activity of it, of, of making sure I memorize everybody's names. But then on Zoom, their names are right there. So <laughs> right. it's like it's it's uh you have to find other ways and so i do that by small groups right i i divide people into small groups and then we come back into the bigger group um and they've they've looked at the reading in some cases they've watched the lecture and so the synchronous time can be much shorter so they don't have they don't feel like they're three hours on on zoom for the class or even four hours in some cases so for me it's it's two hours is the maximum that i'll do synchronously and then assign people other things outside of that. That's awesome. Those are a lot of good, good things. Even just the idea of standing up. I know that was a tough thing for me because I like to stand when I teach. Yeah. yeah and sure. so then when I sit, and then so the lecture is just very slow and boring. So hi everybody, we're going to talk about stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I like that. And G memorizing people's names is always a tough one for me. Once you get over like. Once it's more than like 25 people in the class, I'm yeah. like, oh, this is, yeah. this is a challenge. No, but I, I do it up to, I've done it up to, um, up to 50. That's great. In, in one class. But then, you know, as soon as the class is over, I'm just completely useless. It just, it just <laughs> leaves, leaves the brain. But, but there's a lot of mnemonic devices when they're sitting in front of you, right? Like, and they, and they 
continually sit there that that really helps okay. so it's like everybody stay where you're sitting exactly. <laughs> wherever you sat last time sit there again this time and you know <laughs> honestly even if it, even if it takes you two-thirds of the class i find that students really appreciate the effort you know mm -hmm. they really do that's true right that's a big part of uh, the college experience it's not just about getting information in your head it's about a certain level of recognition and community uh yeah. and so yeah feeling like i've seen that the, the professor cares about me it's not just like ah these students here to worship at my feet yeah, uh, yeah. i really try to avoid sounding like i know everything about the discipline because i don't <laughs> And which isn't so it's not hard, but, um, but really making sure that they know that they're seen and that they're welcomed and that their 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 intrinsic value is not caught up in their final grades. You know, I really make sure that that's clear because yeah, yeah. there's just so much stress and anxiety and and sometimes personal grief and, you know, stress at home. And, you know, so it's it's a it's a learning community. That's what I try to say every every semester that this is our learning community and i and then i always repeat that that really stupid um cliche of don't let don't let um university get in the way of your education you know like use this material to explore things that you're interested in you know and that that spark your attention and so in in you know integrate habits into your learning that will last beyond the degree sort of an idea yeah, it's, it's a cliche, but it's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> it bears repeating for sure. Mm -hmm. um, well, geez, we do, I, you know, don't want to keep you too long. We're trying to be efficient with our time here. Yes. But uh, one of the things that you mentioned uh, very briefly uh, was photography um, that, you know, you used to be into photography and at a certain point you kind of make that career choice and all that. Um, but I've, you know, seen some of your photos and you really take some beautiful photos. Thank you. And um, I wonder if you could maybe say a little bit about that side of your work and kind of talk about Holyscapes a little bit, maybe, oh, so sure. people know that side, because yeah. it's you have so many great things to offer, and I think that's a really special one. Yeah, I appreciate that, actually. Um, so, yeah, when I got to Vancouver, I, I wanted to start a new blog on this, you know, nexus between the uh, spiritual and the and the ecological, the, you know, so spiritual ecology, religion ecology, but also the sort of contemplative notion of inner and and outer landscapes, and not that they're separate domains, but that they're contours, they're different folds within a single whole, I guess you'd say, right? Uh, but anyway, so Holyscapes is like the the blog, the website, and then. I, I named my Instagram account Holyscapes, so a lot of my photography shows up there. Um, but yeah, I've always, I was interested in photography before I got to anthropology, right? In high school, my, I discovered my dad's um, uh, photo enlarger, right? Those big analog photo enlargers. And I set up a dark room in my bathroom and took photography classes in high school. And I was hooked. I just fell in love with photography. And it's a kind of visual anthropology, right? I mean, that's really what photography is. So I love photography and then ended up, you know, formally studying anthropology, but brought photography with me all along. Um, and so, yeah, for me, um, the photography side of things is a contemplative practice that really, you know, in some ways, it, iPhone photography can obscure your connection to the land, but in another way, it attunes you to its presence, right? Like in the same way that going out and bird watching attunes you to the various kinds of bird song and bird species, I find that photography done contemplatively can also do that. You're tuned into the light, you're tuned into the color, you're tuned into the the change, you know, the shift. Um, and so I find, yeah, I think photography for me is a, is a contemplative practice. And sometimes I'll use my photographs in my PowerPoints. And so I feel like maybe more my, I spend more time making PowerPoints than anything, but <laughs> I still, you know, I try to incorporate my photographs into PowerPoints, but yeah, the visual side of things is really 
an important part of my uh, contemplative practice, I guess, and also just sort of uh, um, elicitation for essay writing and thinking and uh, those sorts of things. So yeah. the, the photo essay is kind of a thing for me. Yeah, I yeah. like that a lot. And I think, I mean, all the evidence suggests uh, it helps to have images when you're really trying to reach people, you know, so for teaching, yeah. for communicating, uh, having having powerful images is a really important way to communicate. Uh, so yeah, I really appreciate that about your work and just the general multimedia, mixed media kind of approach you have to teaching. Uh, I think that's really helpful. And especially for those of us like myself, who mostly just talk, uh, it's, it's helpful to know, especially when we're online now uh, with so much stuff that, you know, there are other ways to communicate aside from just kind of flapping your gums all the time. Although I would say that, um, you know, I've heard you speak at conferences. I've never been in any of your classes, but I love the way that I love your um, style of presentation and teaching, you know, it's in, a, in a conference, in a conference setting that can be quite pedantic and dry. It's always good to attend one of your sessions because you really have a good sort of, um, you know, you don't water things down. It's not colloquial, but you, you really kind of communicate well. So I've, I've always appreciated that about you. Well, thank you. And yeah. once you start complimenting me, that means it's time to stop because <laughs> yeah. now I've been embarrassed. Uh, uh, <laughs> all right. So we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Jason Brown, thanks so much for making time for us today. Uh, and thanks to everybody for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back next week with some more stuff for you. In the meantime, take care of each other and be well. <laughs>